Okay, welcome to the Beach Nourishment Public Information Session. This is John Ramsey, the engineer who is um, designing the project and will be um, working with us on getting it out to bid and getting the sand out to the beach in the right quantities and the right mixture. And he's been working with us for over 15 years on different projects around our shoreline and situate. So he's quite familiar with the area and um, he's actually designed this project 10 years ago. We just got it permitted, so, and the funding. So it's been, a, it's been kicking around for a little while. So hopefully this. Okay, so I, I hope that the, the folks can hear me at home. I'm sure if people cannot hear me at home, they'll let us know. Um, so I'm here to talk about the, the North Situate Beach Nourishment Project. Um, and so yes, it's been a long time coming, uh, but we're now in the process of, of getting this out to bid and getting material on the beach. Um, so I'll be talking, kind of going through some background. I just want to kind of bring people back up to speed because it's been such a long time um, and then go through the process of, of what this is going to look like and what the, uh, you know, this, the disruption to your life is going to be over, over the, the winter months. Um, it looks like it's going to be probably starting sometime in, in January, February, going through early April. So uh, this is going to happen. Uh, we're getting it out to bid this uh, later this fall. Um, so this is just to uh, kind of give you the heads up of, of what's going to be going on. Uh, so as, as Corey had said, um, I've been working here for, for quite a few years. I used to be with Applied Coastal. I'm now with Sustainable Coastal Solutions. Um, but that's, you know, the, we are continuing to work. Uh, kind of the same team has been working on the project uh, through permitting, design, and uh, now getting it, rolling it up to construction. Uh, so I just want to talk about, I mean, you guys who have uh, lived on the beach and, and seen what's been going on over the years, um, you know, obviously one of the things that that's everybody's been looking at is the structures over time, all the seawalls, uh, which had a lot of damage to the seawalls. The town right now is going through getting some FEMA funding uh, secured for, for some other seawall work a little bit further north than our project is going to go. Um, but, you know, again, the seawalls over time, and I'll be talking about this, probably repeating myself a bit, but I want you guys to understand that, you know, when the seawalls were built, they were built in the beach. Over time, that beach has eroded away. That we put the rocks down in front of it to try to protect the footing. The beach is still continuing to drop. Um, so really we're, we're kind of fighting mother nature the whole time because we want to fix that line in the sand and say, this is our neighborhood. We don't want it to go away. Uh, but you know, as things keep getting worse and worse, you know, obviously the waves are continuing to crash over the wall. Um, you know, and it's not just because of sea level rise or climate change. It is just because your beach is going down. And so bigger waves can actually get to your wall. Um, so that's, you know, and that's just something that is, you know, pretty common throughout Massachusetts in any developed shoreline, uh, especially in the Northeast where we've developed coastal communities right up against the shore. Um, and, and obviously a lot of these communities are, are pretty old. Um, so one of the things I did want to point out, uh, and just for information purposes, you know, when we think about just, you know, how this is affecting your houses, it's one thing, but the other side of it is, you know, these are, uh, you know, all the roads are evacuation routes to, to get you out of harm's way. Um, and it's not just out of harm's way, there's also the concept if you guys decided to stay in your house during a storm and maybe your house is high and dry, but you are, your evacuation route may be cut off. Um, so if you have a medical emergency, et cetera, you know, some of those issues are very important to make sure. Um, I think people who live out in Rock are, you know, end up getting completely cut off for days at a time. So it's, it's and you know, they have to plan for it, but you know, in North Situated, it's, it's something that you don't think about probably as much um, but obviously Bailey's Causeway um, uh, on the left here, uh, Bailey's Causeway, that blue is just the area that's flooded when we have 8.3 feet of water. And that 8.3 feet of water is what we get on an annual basis, the annual storm. So every year, Bailey's Causeway is underwater, uh, likely for, for a period of time and basically cut off. Um, and so, you know, when we get a 10 year storm or a hundred year storm, it's much worse. And some other areas, obviously the Surfside, et cetera, are completely cut off. But that's just kind of an example, just because, you know, we built a road across the salt marsh. What did we expect? Um, so, it, but that's, that's kind of the thing that we're trying to deal with. And one of the things we want to do is make sure that we're trying to make this community as resilient as possible as we, as we move forward. So one of the things I also want to touch on is historic damages. Uh, so those red dots on the map, those are what is, and the reason why the dots are big is not, not so you guys can see them necessarily. It's more for protecting privacy, so people can't really tell you exactly which house it is. Um, but these are all what's called repetitive loss damage houses. These are houses that have been damaged repeated times since 
FEMA went into effect in 1978. Um, and so we have, uh, you're behind the area with the seawall. We have 75 homes that have had repetitive loss damages, a total of 81 homes that have, have had damages of some kind. So there's another six that have only been likely damaged once. Um, but for the most part, you know, a lot of the houses behind the seawall um, get damaged. And since 1978, we've had $11.4 million of FEMA claims. And you know, everybody might think, well, that's only $11.4 million of damage. That's not that bad. But all you think about is a lot of people don't report their, their claims. A lot of people just fix up their own houses. So that is a very mild estimate of the level of damage that houses have been impacted since uh, FEMA went into effect. Um, and obviously, uh, I should mention that FEMA went into effect after the 78 blizzard. And the 78 blizzard is still the stormer record uh, for this area. So that's that really did the most damage in this area. Um, down below is just uh, you know something from a modest nor'easter in 2013, 2013 or 20, 2015. Um, so it was winter storm Juno, which was, was you know, probably about an eight year storm. But I mean, the amount of damage that it did to houses along Surfside and, and other places was pretty dramatic. Just to kind of give you an idea of obviously what, what you guys know that you've been dealing with, but also just sort of getting an idea of what we're trying to protect against. Um, you know, understanding that this is, is a challenging area. Um, so beyond uh, the, the concept of what the damage to homes is, uh, there's also damage to the roads, the infrastructure. Um, and this is just an example from uh, Winter Storm Lima in 2013, just along uh, Glades Road. Um, you know, there was $274,000 of road repairs just from that, that one storm. Uh, Surfside Road had another $630,000 dollars of road repairs and then Egypt Beach uh, the burn <coughs> the cobble burn that's out of Egypt Beach uh, required another over a million dollars just to make sure that the, the, that the, that didn't breach into the pond uh, so that just kind of gives you an idea from a modest start so this is the kind of money that the town is spending on a recurring basis and it's not getting less it's getting more so um, you know as we're looking forward to trying to develop projects this is you know this is the kind of thing that we're looking at and keeping in mind so if we bounce back a long time and start thinking about what this area used to look like and, and uh, you know, every, everybody always has their memories and, and everyone knows the beach was, you know, this beautiful sandy wide beach and it was perfect sand. Well, actually, this beach was a really nice sandy beach and, and pretty wide. It was, it, it was, a, it was actually, a, you know, a quite dramatic change over time. Um, so, you know, obviously the seawalls went in at some point and, and, you know, there's records of those going into the early 1900s in certain places. Um, but they went in with you know, low granite walls. You can kind of see them in the back of the top picture, um, way up on the beach. Um, and then over time, again, as the beach lowered and eroded away, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll probably repeat this, you know, the, the sediment source for your, your beaches was all this land that was undeveloped. So as that land, like, uh, like Fourth Cliff, kind of eroded away, that's, that materials provided the sand for the down beaches. As we armored all those, those places along the coast, all of a sudden, we don't have that sediment source for the beach. So we hold the line. The beach is going to, you know, it, 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 the wave action is going to continue to want to grab sand off the beach, but there's nothing to replace it. So basically, what ends up happening is your beach is lowering over time. Um, so this just gives you an idea of what it did look like. Um, but you know, again, this is there was some armoring here, and certainly when you had a major nor'easter, I'm sure that that armoring was getting hit, and that beach was starting to lower even then. Uh, the one thing, other thing I'd like to point out in the bottom picture, because somebody's going to ask me about sand and stuff, and I brought a sample of what your sand actually looks like. Um, this is actually the native sand. It is kind of a mixture of sand and gravel. Um, and, that's what we, and we'll end up trying to replace it with, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I do want you guys to realize that your natural beach system is a mix of sand and gravel. It gets sandy in the summer when the, when the, the mile of waves bring it on shore. That would get coarser in the winter, but that's a very important part of making sure that the beach doesn't lower quickly. If you put all sand in there, and again, I'm going to get to this a little bit further later, but if you put all sand in there, it's just going to erode very quickly, um, and it's not going to provide the, the protection, the longevity that you want, and it's also not going to perform the way the beach does now. It's, it's, it's going to perform worse, and, and I can talk about that with some, some of the previous work that had been done. Um, this is just another historic photo, kind of a comparison of, of an area that's, that's, you can actually look on the Top right. Unfortunately, the Historic Society doesn't have the dates of these those yeah. photos. Uh, uh, you know, we can all guess that they're you know, early 1900s ish, uh, but it gives you kind of an idea of what you know that beach may have looked like 
and the high tide line where that rack line is where the seaweed came up to. So you can still see you have a, a, a nice wide beach at high tide. Um, and then obviously in 2016, I mean, I think everybody knows that you basically have a low tide beach and that's about it. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of what we're, we're dealing with. And that's just the, the condition that we're, we're dealing with for the design. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of a project history uh, from what, and, and this is kind of important from why we can do what we can do. Uh, so in 1967, the Army Corps came in um, and back in those days, uh, you could easily dredge offshore and put sand and pump it on the beach. Um, that is very difficult to do now. Um, but you know, the Army Corps went in and found an offshore borrow site and pumped sand under the beach. At the time, there wasn't a lot of analysis done by the Corps. Um, it was just, let's get sand on the beach. Um, and likely what they pumped onto the beach was very fine sand because in the lower profile here, if you go out and look offshore, the, you know, the sand is like talcum powder basically. And so they pumped this onto the beach and they pumped it just up as a slope against the wall. Um, and within a couple of years, it was basically gone. It wasn't really an engineered beach nourishment. It was really a, um, you know, I would call it beneficial reuse, but it was just a, you know, they, they really were just trying to get sand in the system. And so, it, you know, even though it disappeared from this area, it, you know, went down Oceanside and provided you know, more protection for areas going down towards Egypt Beach and, and Oceanside. So it's, it's, you know, this isn't lost. It's just, you know, it didn't last for protection here. Um, but because of that, you know, that project, they had about 2,500 foot project and they basically, uh, they didn't do a taking, but the town ended up doing a taking later on of that, of all the, that, those lots. So it's a public beach. Um, and that means there's, you know, there's a public benefit. So a lot of problems that we have in Massachusetts, myself as a coastal engineer, is a lot of towns have a lot of people who own the beach. And part of the problem is you have to give up public access easements in order for public money to be used for shore protection. I mean, it makes sense from, you know, why should public money be used to protect private property? But the people who own waterfront property never want to give up that right. They don't want public, you know, they, they pay a lot of money for their house, I, I understand but it, it becomes an issue. In this case, we actually have a public beach for that 2,500 feet. It's the, the taking's already been done. Um, so nobody, no, no private person owns that stretch of beach that we're gonna be nourishing. Um, so, uh, which is, is really a, a good thing um, in this case. Um, and so this is uh, actually just a map of the taking. So this was you know, done. Um, so it goes basically um, from Bailey's Causeway um, all the way three, to 350 feet south of Mitchell Avenue. So it gives you kind of the idea of where the footprint is. And so that's the footprint of the, the, the main project that we ended up designing. And I'm hoping everybody can see that well enough. Um, but uh, yeah, usually I'm used to having a monstrous screen like the one behind me. <laughs> but since we have people on Zoom, um, I'll answer questions at the end. I, I prefer to wait, if that's okay. Um, and so, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, from, from the historical standpoint, uh, this, there have been a whole series of seawalls or revetments uh, built over time. You know, the first recorded stuff that we've seen is around 1907. Um, and, you know, that, that was, uh, there was a, several uh, granite walls that were built in various areas, and you kind of saw those in the pictures. Um, in the 40s, and, uh, 1940s to 1960s was when a majority of the concrete seawall work was done. Um, and basically along that, you know, that uh, stretch all the way down to Surfside. Um, and then uh, one thing I, I do want to point out, uh, even though it's not directly related to this project, is there also, um, you know, when you get down to uh, uh, Egypt and Manhill Beach, that area is also, quote unquote, a, a structure in the, in the sense that it is a cobble berm that is actually a, uh, an engineered cobble berm. So this, you know, the, the shore, shoreline is engineered for the whole distance, uh, even though that's more a softer type of protection. Um, and so lastly, you know, obviously one of the things that's happened a lot, um, you know, I've certainly worked with the town on a few of these. You know, FEMA has had, uh, you know, there's been a lot of damage to the revetments and seawalls throughout the town. And, the, you know, the town's gone and, and had FEMA come and assess those and, and uh, you know, the town is going through uh, many revetment projects at this point uh, with uh, federal, uh, you know, portion of it, at least paid for by federal money. But again, it's, it's kind of chasing that, that uh, it, it only gets worse. You know, every, the revetments get, uh, every time we have a, a major storm, we're getting more and more damage. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really kind of, at some point, uh, the the, uh, fight or the financial side of it doesn't work. We already know that FEMA's, uh, 
underwater and it's not going to get any better nationally. So it's, you know, right now we're able to, you know, kind of put, the, put our fingers in the dike and, and keep it going. But I, I, you know, I'm not sure if that's going to be a lasting thing that FEMA is always going to come in um, and to be something to count on as far as, you know, for, I think FEMA will be there for homeowners, but I'm not quite sure um, they're ever, they're going to have the money to do, uh, you know, unless it's a major disaster, like when Fort Myers got wiped out last year, um, they'll come in for that. But I, I, get, I get to the point where I'm starting to wonder for some of these more modest or <coughs> they're going to keep responding to that. Um, so I, the last thing I sort of want to touch on uh, as far as the, the historical mm -hmm. stuff is kind of the, the nature side of things. Um, you know, as I mentioned, when we, you know, we put the, the seawalls in, we're fixing the, the, the shoreline and the shoreline wants to move. Um, historically, this is actually we're eroded at greater than one foot per year, but since 1950, it's eroded at about one foot per year. Um, in 1950, the seawalls were pretty much all in. So that, you know, so even with the seawalls in, you did still see some erosion of the beach, but it's slow because the beach can't erode past the seawall. So basically you're, you're, you're get to zero once you, once you're, you have no beach, right? So, that, you know, the, the erosion rate is not natural anymore. It's, it's, it's held by that seawall. So it, it's getting you know, down by zero, but by doing that, by putting those seas walls, we eliminated that sediment supply. So, you know, the only way that we're going to ever be able to deal with that is to mitigate it by resupplying the sediment. We can't, you know, we can't, uh, you know, we've lost that resource or it's gone elsewhere. Um, if we want to maintain that shoreline and, and maintain it in a, a sense so that you're not getting large waves against the seawall and you're not having the seawalls collapse because they're undermined, you are going to need to raise the beach in some way. And that sediment can't just be created. Um, it, you, all your sources are gone uh, or are locked up in behind seawalls. So you're going to have to do something to bring that sediment back to the system. And so I just want to show this example. Uh, you know, I, I have a few examples I want to show, but it's just, it, to me, it was a, a really good picture. This is a, just a pretty calm day with just some swell. Um, this is up in uh, kind of the winter of Revere line. And this is a seawall, similar condition to what you guys have. But it's just this, this mild swell, and all of a sudden you're getting overtopping, not even a high tide from a dumping <clears> kind of wave because there is no beach and the waves can stand up higher in deeper water because your, your beach is gone. Uh, you basically end up with a, a smaller wave that can just get over the seawall. Um, so you know, if you ended up with a beach that's higher, the wave energy that's dissipated on the beach and can't run up and over the seawall. So it's, it really, it, it, it's a raising, just raising the profile. Um, of anything or making it shallower water so that the, the bigger waves break um, further offshore or uh, smaller when they get to the, the, the seawall, they won't go over. Um, but this is just, you know, this is what we're dealing with everywhere. Um, and that seawall had, had actually been recently just capped and con were constructed. So they actually raised it and still the modest wave conditions were going right over. Um, so just as, as kind of a guide as to, to what this happens. So if you, if you look at a, um, uh, you know, natural beach on the left, there's your initial shoreline. Um, you know, when, when you have the shore wants to retreat and give up some of the sand, you know, basically the whole profile just moves back. So the, the form never changes. When you put a seawall, even that you know, on the right there, when you put the seawall, even if it's in the back beach, when your beach erodes because it, you know, nature wants to take some sand away and you don't have no other sediment source coming, the water just gets deeper and deeper against the seawall. So it's just kind of repeating what I already said, but I sort of want to do it in a pictorial sense so you can kind of get an idea. Um, just, you know, and it's, again, this is, you know, there's nothing wrong with us trying to hold the shoreline, but there are costs to it and there's an effect to it. And it's, it's something that, that you just need to keep in mind. Um, so I, I sort of what I want to do before I jump into the, the beach nourishment in detail, I want to sort of give you a guide as to what, why we're doing things the way we're doing them. Um, you know, the kind of goals of what we were trying to do uh, was basically reduce damage to public and private infrastructure. Uh, that's, that's where the overall goal is. Um, and I, obviously part of that is to maintain emergency access and egress to the best uh, way that we can. Um, and then, you know, it, as an ancillary goal, one of the things what, by adding sand or raising the beach, we're extending the life of the seawall. Because right now in seawalls, you know, some of the footings are showing, you know, there's been revetment stone put down to cover those footings, but that starts dropping away and the revetment footings again are, are come up. Then we have sinkholes in the road and, and we go through the whole process of trying to uh, manage that. If we bring the, the level of 
beach up, all of those issues are delayed. So I'm not going to say they're going away, they're delayed. Um, uh, so again, so what we're looking from a resiliency standpoint, we want to prevent further beach lowering. Um, and we want to try to restore that sediment supply because this beach nourishment, even though we're putting it in one place, is going to move. Um, it's going to protect this area for a certain length of time, but that material in general is going to migrate more southerly than northerly um, just because of the direction of, of sediment transport along this coastline. Um, and that material will end up, you know, helping people further south on Surfside and then, you know, down in the Egypt Beach area eventually. Uh, so that material will move in that way, um, but at the same time, it will protect this area uh, for, for a, a, a decent amount of time. Um, so our full project that we had permitted and designed is that full length of the Army Corps project, 2,500 feet, about a half a mile, um, or 2,900 feet, sorry, a little over half a mile. Um, it was going to require 240,000 cubic yards, and just to give you an idea, a big dump truck holds about 22 cubic yards. So this is 12,000 truckloads. That would be the full project. So this is a massive project, um, and I will, I'm going to give you an example and talk about Winter Beach that we had done uh, back in 2014-2015. Um, that was about 500,000 cubic yards, and it was all trucked in. So I, I, you know, it can be done, it's just not the prettiest thing to have happen. Uh, construction time for a project like that with about 80 truckloads per day is going to, would take about six months uh, at five to six days a week, depending on, on uh, how things go. Um, and the estimated cost of 2015 is 8.2 million. I hate to tell you, but it, as everybody knows, the cost of skyrocketed on everything, uh, especially construction related, material related stuff. So again, that cost estimate is probably not all that helpful, but it gives you current, sort of at least the magnitude of what we're looking at. And then the approximate design life. When we talk about design life, that's how long this is going to provide, you know, kind of that 100-year protection, 100 for the 100-year storm, and that's only about 10 years. But that doesn't mean it's not protecting from lesser storms for a longer period, and then it's also <coughs> providing sand for down-earth beaches, which will also protect over time. So anything that's doing to, to lessen the wave climate anywhere, it's, it's a net benefit, and it's also a net benefit for all the seawalls in the area by not getting their toe exposed. So there's there's benefits beyond just the direct protection of beach nourishment from a 100 year storm event. Um, so this is the, the length that we would be going if if we were doing the full project. We And I will say this ahead of time, we do not have the money for the full project. And there'll be a couple of figures here, so you don't have to get too caught up in the plans. But this is a, a massive beach nourishment. The flat part is 100 feet wide, and that is only a couple feet below the height of the seawall. And then it slopes down from there. So this is, you know, this is an engineered beach nourishment. Um, it's not just a, you know, a random like like what the core did, where they just built a slope right up against the shoreline and immediately built it. That was at such a low level, the first storm that hit it got above it and just ripped it out. Uh, this is meant to be two feet above the hundred-year storm surge level, the, the level of the beach. And again, I will don't don't get confused because I will show some more figures so you get a better idea of what this looks like. But this would extend. From 74 Glades Road all the way down to, to uh, 35 Surfside, um, and that's the that's the full length of that Army Corps project that, that we have as a public template that we can use. Um, oh, and actually, so if you look at the bottom, and unfortunately, this is kind of the odd scale, but this is kind of one to one scale. So kind of what it's going to look like, it's going to be flat out from the seawall for 100 feet, and then it goes down at what we call one in ten. That's a that's a engineering term. But basically, for every 10 feet you walk out, the beach drops one foot. So it's about as steep as a typical beach is. It's, it's, your beach is flatter than that because it has that nice, very gradual shelf that goes out. But it's kind of the upper beach slope that you have right now is about a 1 on 10 slope. So it gives you an idea of that's what you'd be, you'd be going out 100 feet and then walking down a slope similar to what your upper beach looks like now. And so this is kind of a an aerial view, unfortunately, the colors really don't show up here very well, but you can always go on the, because uh, we're recording this, you can go on the Zoom link and, and it probably shows up better on the on your computer screen that's gonna show up here. Um, but this is kind of the, the, the you know, you can't see it, blue's washed out. But the blue, so so basically this is kind of what the footprint looks like at high tide. So the, the lightest color is, is above high tide and then slopes off and, and you see what's most in the water um, at, at high tide. Uh, so again, so high tide is, so I, I use something around mean sea level as my, my datum 
So to give you an idea, high tide is about five feet above that. Uh, and this is the, the uh, berm height is going to be 12 feet above mean, mean sea level. So that, that 100 foot wide uh, beach is going to be seven, seven feet above high water. To give you an idea of, of, of how high it's going to be or how much material. So it's going to look very different than what, what you're looking at now. It's going to be a much higher beach. Um, so uh, where we are, uh, so right now, uh, the town received about $2 million in a CCM grant last year. Um, fortunately, we received another $2 million this year. So we're looking at being able to spend $4 million on a project, which is great. I mean, it's, that's, uh, you know, most of this is state funded. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, make the limits of this somewhere on the order. It's probably going to be 1,200 to 1,500 linear feet that we're going to be able to do, including kind of the tapers at the end. Um, but we're still working on exactly how wide our berm's going to be. It is going to be that height. We may narrow it to about 75 feet and see if we can stretch it a little bit further along the beach rather than doing the 400. Uh, but again, we're looking at uh, 60 to 80 trucks per day. Um, and so over a three month period, we're looking at 2,700 to, to 3,600 truck loads that we're going to be bringing here. Uh, and again, this is likely February uh, and March and, in, in, you know, and maybe starting in late January. But you, you get the idea that we're, we're looking at a, you know, a two to three month period that we're gonna be uh, going pretty hard with the trucks. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the truck route in just a little bit. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about uh, sediment in a little, uh, um, little bit. Um, some people, when I originally uh, were talking about getting this grant, uh, some people were concerned because of, of the cobble material that was that was down at uh, uh, Egypt and, and Man Hill, uh, the material that was placed down there. This is nothing like that. This is a very different beach, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have any gravel in it. This, this beach does naturally have gravel in it, and we want to make sure, uh, again, that it has that gravel component because that helps the beach, beach's longevity. But again, in the summer, that, you know, that's just like it does now, that's going to naturally sort out. The gravel kind of shows up in the winter, kind of looks at, at up in the upper part of the beach in those little bars. And in the summer, the sand is going to move back in and cover it over. Um, you know, you guys always see your, your bar offshore um, in the winter. And in the summer, the bar kind of just migrates back onto the shore. And that's the same thing that's going to happen with this. The bar is going to be I mean, in a slightly different place because we can push the trolling out, but it's going to be the same kind of thing. It's a very flat profile. You get very powerful waves in the winter. Um, they love to pull sand out into a bar and, uh, and then it'll, it'll move back on. So I should point out that there's no cobble in this direction <laughs> at all, okay? <laughs> and I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, so right now, uh, we're still playing with footprint. We just got notified of the award for the additional money uh, last week, week and a half ago. Yeah, so I mean, so we're really just trying to scramble to get our plans in place to, to make sure we can do we can spend that money during this construction season. So we're, uh, this is kind of just a, a quick drawing of, of what we're initially planning. As I said, we're probably gonna stretch this out a little bit more. Um, this is a hundred foot wide berm with about 60,000 cubic yards. We may be able to get as much as 80,000 cubic yards depending on what the bids come in at. Um, so we, we will be stretching that along shoreline. We are going to be centering this around the beach access um, uh, at the, uh, you know, right where, where the veterinary glaze road is. So, uh, again, yeah, right, again, again, right? So, so, um, you know, I'm going to get these wrong <laughs> too, too, many, too many of my brain, but yeah, so, so that beach access again is going to be where we're, uh, making our beach access. That's where, you know, the construction equipment is going to be stored. Um, so that will probably be shut off for that time period of construction. Um, but you know, the other access, you know, other beach accesses will be open. Uh, for people, some of those stairs that might end up getting buried, but that's okay. It's, it just makes you fewer stairs to walk down to, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, just just to give you an idea, but this, you know, again, it's going to be, you know, you know, a construction site. So, you know, again, use caution when you when you guys are out there. Um, I'm sure that the, you know, this is a pretty straightforward, simple thing. Um, but again, I'll show some pictures from Winthrop of, of how it looks during construction when you're doing this kind of thing. Um, but I just want I want people to be aware that this will be kind of look like a construction site for for some time. Uh, we, right now we're looking at the center of the nourishment being at, at, the, at that access, but we may shift it north or south a little bit. My guess is we'd like to shift it slightly north. I just want to make sure it doesn't interfere with what the town's doing as far as 
summer event network and make sure we're, we're staying out of their way um, because the, the town is, has got some team of money being spent just north of Grasshopper. Right? Not a lot of money. Yeah. But that only down the south is Grasshopper, right? Or does it go further south? No, it goes all the way. I'm oh, sure. Make that happen. But yeah, something's got to yeah. take we'll make priority. <laughs> we'll make it there first. <laughs> we will make it work. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> Um, so this is, you know, again, I'm, I apologize that these don't show up well, and, and you know, next time we're just going to have the you know, monster screen here. But this, this is kind of just, you know, you know, I had shown before how long the shoreline stretch we were going to do. You know, this this is only going to end up being somewhere around a third of the total volume of the nourishment. So, you know, give you an idea of, of what what we can do with the amount of money. Um, so this is, you know, we're, we're just trying to, to do what we can um, with the wool. A luck, uh, you know, town could come up with additional funds and and or the, the state in the coming years, and we'll just continue to build on this if we can. Um, so hopefully everything's in good shape, and we'll, we'll have it in place. Um, so I did want to talk a little about beach nourishment, uh, just the concept. Um, so one of the things, as an engineer, uh, beach nourishment it gets a, a really bad name in a lot of places because most beach nourishment, especially in Massachusetts, that's done is what I call beneficial reuse. Somebody happens to be dredging a channel and they just throw it on the beach. Um, and that's just generally the way it's done. And then the next high tide, all of a sudden it's spread into some adjacent inlet and everybody's up in arms because it wasn't, you know, the wide, wide was throwing, throwing money away. Um, as a coastal engineer, you know, we do, as I said, engineer beach nourishment. That's why the elevation is so high. Um, and that's why I'm dealing with making sure that I'm using what's called compatible sediment to the beach. Those two things are very important. Um, and those to make sure that the height is important to make sure that, that storm waves are not overtopping the berm. Um, because as soon as storm waves or any waves overtop the berm, it, it starts collapsing very quickly. Um, and the other thing is uh, you know, the compatibility of the sediment. Uh, again, as the core project proved, you know, if you if you pump fine sand onto a beach, it goes away very quickly. Um, if it, if the beach happened to be fine sand, like if you go up to Nahant, the the beach along the causeway there in Nahant is very fine. That's if you put that compatible sand on there, it will perform like a duck, like but it's a protected beach, so that makes sense. You guys have a very energetic, pretty much open ocean beach from when it comes down to it, and you know the type of material from you know, derived from the glacial materials around is ends up being a mix of different materials. And because of that, it performs in a very different way. And you need to bring a material that's compatible with that. So uh, first thing, kind of beach nourishment 101. Um, for us, when I'm designing beach nourishment, I want to do as long a shoreline stretch as I can. And unfortunately, I'm also limited by funds, but I do want to kind of give an indication, in this case, a thousand feet Beach nourishment might only quote unquote last in that one area for about three years. And I'm not saying that's for this site. Um, but if I double the nourishment, I will get 12 years. <coughs> um, so, so basically, doubling the length of nourishment along a shoreline quadruples the length or quadruples the, the longevity. So, that's it's a good thing if you have more money or you know, if you can do the full project, you really want to try to do that. This project was always planned to be phased uh, because we knew that it was you know, just from the logistics standpoint of getting that many truckloads, we knew that we were probably going to have to do this as a multi-year project. Um, so it's it's understandable that, that you know maybe this part of this beach nourishment will erode away before we uh, have other funds available to uh, do the next phase. Um, so the other I've already touched on this, the seasonal beach aspect. Uh, people need to to be aware of this because when we put this in in the winter, the first thing that's going to happen is new mother nature is going to grab a bunch of sediment and put it in the bar. And you guys are going to say, wait a second, you just put all this nourishment down here and wasted it. It's gone away. It's not gone. It's sitting in the bar and next, the next summer you will see it back on the beach. So it's, it, it's meant to, you know, we're, we're filling this profile as an engineered slope, but nature is not going to let that engineered slope stay the way we put it. It's going to modify it. It's going to flatten it. It's going to turn it into that natural bar in the winter. That bar is going to migrate back on in the summer. So you know, when we when we're done here, you're going to see that that effect. And also at the ends, you're also going to see rapid losses uh, as it moves out because it's just the way you know the anything you put out and, and if you stand out the water and push something out the water, every everything wants to focus on that. So when you put a 
kind of this protrusion into the ocean. So the laser we're going to want to focus on that. And so the ends are the first, first pieces that kind of get spread out. So you're going to see spreading losses and you're going to see losses offshore. But none of that material is being lost. It's all just, it's going to come back seasonally and, and uh, move along other parts of the shore to protect those from the ends. Uh, so talking about beach sediment, I brought a sample of your beach here. Uh, so if anybody wants to come up and look at it. So when you guys kind of walk along the beach, you're, you know, in the summer, uh, this was actually taken in January, but uh, when you walk along the beach, you know, it, it's a sandy cover for the most part. Uh, you do see that, that bit of gravel uh, that I'm showing you the picture here. Um, but if you actually dig down, there's a lot of gravel in your sand. Um, so, um, and then we want to make sure we're replicating that. Uh, and the, the main reason is, is because in the winter, when that material gets all stirred up and the sand gets pulled off, that's the stuff that kind of self armors your beach to some extent and keeps it from lowering. It slows down the lowering of the beach. So you want to have that material in there. It creates those bars that, that uh, can last. Uh, so this is just a, another couple uh, pictures uh, along the seawall. Again, this was uh, this past January. Uh, I'm just giving you the, the, the trowel there in the picture. So you can kind of obviously see the size of, of the, the type of material we're gonna be trying to bring in as part of this. Um, so it's maybe about 25% of our material is going to be you know, this kind of one to three inch gravel rounded. It's not going to be, you know, angular crushed rock. This is going to be from a natural source. It's going to be rounded stone. Um, and this bottom picture just kind of shows you those armor, you know, the, the natural armoring of those bars that kind of form in the winter. And so one of the reasons why we want to uh, use this type of material, um, again, from an engineering standpoint, if we use material that's finer than what's there, uh, it performs a certain way. If we use stuff that's compatible with the the existing beach, I think, performs a different way. And then if we use coarser material, material that's actually coarser than what's there, um, then it's going to perform even, even better in the sense of longevity, but maybe steeper than you ne might necessarily want. For us engineers, we, we typically try to design as coarse or coarser. But we try to match the native beach as close as we can. But if we're going to err on something, we want it to be just slightly coarser. We don't want to be slightly finer. Um, the reason is, is because over time, this is what happens. So if I go back, uh, if you use finer fill material, all your beach just kind of, that's the Army Corps project. You just wash it right into the water. Your, your berm goes to nothing very quickly. If you use fill material that's equal, you get basically the same slope and the same dynamics that you have now. If you use something coarser, you're going to get a steeper beach than you have now. Um, and this, these are kind of over the top on, on all of them. You know, this is, like almost you basically if you use cobble beach, right? That's it's, it's going to stand up to a much steeper slope. Uh, it's kind of like that top one. Um, so what what is our beach sediment going to look like? So we're we're going to be screening this. Basically, what we're trying to do is get about twenty five percent right around the one inch. Uh, you know, we can't limit it too much, but this is sort of what our what our engineer specification would look like. Um, and we we basically want um, you know twenty five percent of this is going to be gravel in some form. The rest of it's going to be sand, and, and, and I, you know, we have some specifications that allow them to have a little bit, you know, like pea gravel in there. They're not going to do it because it's too expensive. Sand's a lot cheaper than gravel, so we're kind of going to have a kind of probably a bimodal distribution where we're going to have one to two inch gravel and the rest sand. So that's just because of that's the way that the uh, what's going to end up being the most cost efficient for the contractor, because um, I'm going to force them to put the gravel component in. They're not going to want to do it. It's really expensive. And then the rest of it's going to be sand, which is really easy and cheap to get around here. So it's, it, I shouldn't say cheap, cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I'll qualify that. Um, and the other thing is, uh, one of the things that we make sure that, that people do is they screen uh, to make sure there's the very limited fines, um, which is very important to making sure we're protecting fisheries, et cetera. Uh, but it's also important that you guys don't want to see uh, a, kind of a, a uh, mud slip offshore. Um, and we don't either. Um, so in this case, we're, we're making it so that it's less than 3% fines. Uh, for dredge material to be beach, you know, to be allowed on a beach, maybe up to 10% fines, we don't even want to be close. So we're going to keep it down you know, below 3%. And we think you know, most of the clean sand deposits around here, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, truck route. So everybody is going to love this. You know, so it is it's basically down down the road through and uh, apologize again for the size. But we're going, you know, we can't really control things off the state road. Uh, or, or, or we can't control what's happening on the state road, I should say. Um, but we can control what's happening on town roads. But the truck route that is permitted 
It still goes through downtown uh, North Situate and, and out to the beach down Denver Road. So it's that's that's the truck route that's permitted, um, and then the beach access will be. Uh, yeah, no, it's going to cost me. <laughs> I see the confusion, but but that is definitely the way we've done it. So what people will, what trucking companies will do is they'll decide how they're coming, where they're coming from, and how they're going to use uh, Route Three A. But they they are going to come off, uh, you know, right down through downtown. Uh, North Situate, and that's you know again that's that went through the whole permitting process, and that's sort of what we're, we've been sort of directed to do uh, at this point. Uh, I don't think that's going to change. Um, we're still working with the, the town to figure out police details or what what's going to be required to make sure that that's safe. Um, but that's you know that will happen you know as part of the, the bidding process and going through and talking to the police to figure out what they need. Uh, but it is there is a uh, a component of the bidding that we're where we are going to. Um, have them set aside money for police detail or details as needed. Um, so the expectations. Um, so as I said, we're probably, you know, again, we don't know exactly how much volume is going to depend on the bids, but we're looking at somewhere a slightly above a third of the full project. Um, as I said, the beach is going to rapidly adjust. I, you know, we, we use the term equilibrate, but you guys are going to use the term, oh my God, where's my beach go? But I, honestly, it's it, it is this is every beach nourishment project I do, I get the same comment. So it's it, it is something you know. It's at first it's it's a concern. After you've seen it over the next several months, you're like, oh, okay, this, this isn't that big of an issue. But there, are, you certainly are going to see some very rapid changes as we're building the beach. Um, but that's you know that's specifically you're going to see rapid loss of what's called dry beach width as this thing adjusts. But after time, you'll, you'll realize that the beach is just kind of uh, adjusting to nature and, and uh, forming what is going to form, but then it's, it's going to stabilize. Um, the, as I said, the ends will run more quickly. Um, that's just because you're, you have that protrusion sticking out. The ways want to focus on the protrusion, so they're going to just push sand away from the middle toward, you know, and away from the ends uh, down both north and south. Uh, that'll be the first thing. And then over time, most of the sand will start moving or in a southerly direction, um, just because that's our, our predominant uh, direction of seven transport. Um, even though we have this cross shore where we're moving it, it that goes out to the bar or long shore, you know, I just want everybody that's why I highlight the red, just want you guys to keep this in mind, the beach material is still providing protection. So if it's moved off to the bar, that bar is a great wave breaker. So it, that's a natural part of the system. That's a way of a, a Natural beach breaks waves. So we, the bigger that bar is, the better off we are. So if the waves are tripped out there, they're not getting the beach firm and, and running up and hitting the seawall. Um, so that's 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 the concept. Um, and if it's moving sideways, it's providing, it's shall, making the water shallower in adjacent areas. So it's helping to protect or reduce the wave heights at those locations. Even if you can't see the sand sticking above the water, even at low tide, it's still providing material that is helping with the, the waves there. Um, and then the future nourishment possibilities, uh, you know, there's still possibility potentially for other resilience grants. There may be dam and seawall funding, although dam and seawall funding have not been very kind to beach nourishment projects. Um, if you, as time goes on, if you guys are monitoring and maintaining this beach nourishment project as an engineer project, you can actually uh, seek FEMA funding for re-nourishment. So this is something that, that in, in the town is, is based on the hook for, for uh, monitoring this anyways. So as long as that's maintained in the future, or there's a commitment to maintain it, um, you know, FEMA funds can be sought if there's damages done, if the, if the emergency is declared, uh, you can actually seek FEMA funds to um, rebuild the nourishment. And I can say at least in Massachusetts, one project in particular down at Dead Neck and Barnesville, they've received money uh, for re-nourishing uh, because they had a you know, long-term monitoring and maintenance plan. And so when they got whacked by a storm, they were able to to get uh, additional funding from the feds. Um, so, and I, I know a lot of people have questions, but I do want to go through this kind of just kind of last thing that I want to talk about, just because I want to give you guys an idea of, of what the effect of this can be. Um, so this is a very large scale beach nourishment um, example from Winthrop. You don't hear a lot about Winthrop. You used to hear a lot about Winthrop. It used to be where everybody went to get really good pictures of nor'easters. And then all of a sudden they stopped going there. I remember the day when they showed up and they called me and said, why are there any waves? It's because we put in a beach nursery. 
Sorry, um, but that it really does have an effect. This is what Winthrop looked like before the beach nourishment. These are the waves going over the seawall. I know you guys have seen this a few places in situ a couple times. Um, so I, I, you know, you're very familiar with this. Um, you know, similar type of thing, repetitive loss damage throughout the entire community. Water going down the backside of the barrier beach into into the uh, Boston Harbor. Um, just you know, just the way it works. Um, uh, one thing, and I, I will kind of give you a little teaser, they never plowed this road because snow never stuck to it. Every time we had a nor'easter, it would get washed away. So they, this was not on anybody's plowing route, which is kind of entertaining. Um, so then there's the horrific picture of having to do a beach nourishment. One thing I will say about this, you do see the discoloration in the water. Um, this, we were, uh, we were trying to get sand from offshore. They wouldn't allow us to get it. This is, this is a very much coarser material uh, for this beach because it was naturally coarser. So you're gonna see more cobbly type material on this beach. What you're seeing here is more of the sand side um, that was mixed, they mixed it on site. Um, but the sand came from the rare, the old 95 embankment up in Saugus um, that when they were gonna have 95 go through uh, downtown Boston, but the project got killed, I don't know, probably 1980-ish or maybe earlier than that. Um, but they'd already brought the material down right across August Marsh. So they're trying to get rid of that embankment ever since, but we use part of it for this beach nourishment. This is also what was used for Revere Beach nourishment as well. And Revere Beach nourishment has lasted since 1980 without being nourished, and it looks great still. Um, but this is this is what, what you know, this is a major example of what the type of construction you look at. This project was much bigger, it was 500,000 cubic yards. Uh, we're looking at you know, 60 to 80 for you guys, 60 to 80,000. So it's kind of order of magnitude higher, but it does give you an idea of the type of construction activity you will see. And I just want to you know, just sort of give you a, uh, an idea. Oh, and I said about the fines. Because we took that embankment material and that was what we were forced to use, that material had just come out of some pit in New Hampshire uh, and had been trained down that we really didn't have a choice uh, because that's what the state kind of mandated us to do, but it did have you know, probably about 10% fines of it. So that's why you kind of see the, the plume in the water. Um, so this is what, this is an aerial photo. I hope everybody see it. So this is an aerial photo. If, if you guys fly into Boston, you see the five sisters, those big breakwaters offshore. Those are actually 3,000 feet offshore. Those, those breakwaters, the stone size is about 30 tons each, where your typical revetment stones are somewhere around six. So if you get an idea of how big the stones are out there, you walk out there sometime at low tide, you can go out and I've never, I've ne I have no idea how they built this in the 1930s with the steam shovels that they had. <laughs> it's amazing, the, the, the equipment that they must have used to build those. Uh, sorry, I digress. Um, but this is, you know, because of that, those breakwaters, they do create a calm area behind them. Um, and there had been some nourishment done. And because that area is calm, these are massive, massive structures. These would cost, you know, each one of those would cost tens of millions of dollars today. So this would be just a massive undertaking. Um, so because when they did beach nourishment, the nourishment migrated behind the breakwaters because the breakwaters kind of turn the waves and it pushes it towards that area behind the breakwaters. So this area was relatively well protected, but the areas where I was showing the pictures were was where all these groins are along the beach. The water, you know, there was there's absolutely no beach there um, before we started the project, and that's in 2008. In 2013, we did the first part of the project where we actually excavated a portion of the, this, what's called the tombolo, this, this, this feature that had been built out behind the breakwaters and moved it to the south. So you see the beach to the south there is much wider. And that was that portion of the beach nourishment. Um, and then we followed on by taking that material from Saugus uh, and, and bringing it down and building the north part. And so the north part, you can see now all of those groin structures are completely covered and by the way, it's not really white, sandy, beautiful Bermuda sand, <laughs> that's snow. Okay, so they all of a sudden got to that point where they had to plow the road and they didn't know that they were going to have to deal with that. So that first like storm they had, they had no road plowing and everybody was like, why is our road not going to plow? <laughs> we never had to do it before. But so that, and, the, and so when well, we had 2018 storms, you know how bad those were for everybody. Um, you know, the, we got a lot of uh, initial, a lot of flack for this project because it didn't look like Revere. We brought in a lot of cobble on purpose because this beach was very cobbly in the first place. Um, but because we brought in the cobble, the beach lasted very well, but the public wasn't very happy with the way it looked. 
So we got a lot of flack, um, specifically from the Speaker of the House, which was very upset about that, understandably. It was his district. Um, but at the same time, I said, you know, give it time. It's going to do that sorting. And, I'll, and, and sure enough, by the next summer, we're not hearing any complaints again. But I, was, I think they were about to put me on a cross and nail me up to the wall for a while there. But, but you know, nature works its way out. But when we had the 2018 storms, um, the Boston Globe came out and said, you know, it's really odd. Well, Linda, this is the first time it's flooded from the backside. It didn't flood from the front side. Must have been a different kind of storm. Yeah. It's like, no, it's because we have this here. So I want you guys to understand that beach nourishment does work and it, it can dissipate the wave energy, um, but it has to be done in an engineered way and, and designed properly so that it can do its job. Um, but it, you know, this is kind of, a, again, a, a, a bold example. And this is just a, some pictures of what it looked like before. Which is you know very gravelly beach, and that's that gravelly beach is actually taken. That picture is actually taken up south because the structure you see on the bottom there is actually a new structure that we put in to hold the end of the beach nourishment a little further up, and all of those groins are completely covered by the beach nourishment on the, on the right photo. Uh, so we we buried all of those structures, and, and now I think just the tips of those structures are just starting to show, um, and that beach nourishment has been in there. You know, uh, part of it's been in there for ten years at this point. Um, so with that, I'll open up to questions. I do, I, I really should put a pitch out, you know, obviously the town's been very committed to this project, um, but, you know, Jason Berger is back there for CCM and they, uh, you know, they put a ton of money into this project and really been very supportive of the concept of each nourishment from, you know, getting this as a, a really good way of, of making sure that the town, the towns, the, the whole state is actually looking at these issues. I know that Duxbury and Marshfield also got a, a bunch of money this year to do a large scale beach nursery as well. Um, and Duxbury Beach Reservation previously to that. So, you know, the, the, town, the state is being very supportive of this. And I think that this is a, a really good thing. The state is really heading in the right direction. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll open up to questions. Fred, do you want to start? Yeah. You <laughs> say, I don't think <laughs> I, just to clear up something that uh, uh, you mentioned a project that was going to be 29 or 2600 feet, many feet, and then another one for 1500 feet. Which which one is which? The, the full project uh, is 2900 feet, the one that's permitted. We just don't have the funding to do all 2900 feet. So we're going to try to stretch out what we can to, it's going to be somewhere on the order of 1500 linear feet, is the, okay. the area that we're going to protect. And, and further, if you don't mind, just a comment. Um, I thought this was the thing that's put on by this by situate with the government instead. And so I had my stuff. And I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to You're not going to hammer me with that? You're going to I know that you know, that I know this is right away. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, nice to see you again after eight years. We're, you know, some of us are here for the, the first one. Does FEMA still reimburse, which they were in 2016, uh, if you maintain 80% uh, after? You don't have to maintain 80%. What you, what, it, what you have to do for FEMA, at least right now, if it's an engineered project, and it, 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 so it was designed to have a short protection standard, which this is, and it's monitored and maintained, like the town is committed to maintaining it, they will if you have a declared emergency, they typically will fund 75% of the, the repair. Is maintaining by maintaining, do you mean put in additional sand or what? how does the town maintain in the eyes of FEMA? In the eyes of FEMA, what, the way this would be set up is that we would have trigger conditions that would need to be met. If a certain amount of erosion happened, you would trigger that. And as long as the town basically is committed to that, you don't have to have actually done it. If you committed to it, then FEMA looks at that as, as the commitment, and then they would, you know, the first time it happens, you could put in a claim. You don't have to go and spend the money and then ask for a claim. Okay, one more question too. Uh, the literal flow goes south. What was the thinking? I know you said it was to center it along the access of, at the gate where the bend is, but what would, what would prevent you from putting the sand further north knowing it was gonna flow south? There, there's really nothing. The, the one thing I want to do, if, if there is additional funding down the road, I want to make sure that we are, you know, kind of creating a beachhead centered where we want it, um, depending on when the funding comes in, just so it's, it's, it's hard to start a beach nourishment in a place like this that has no high tide beach. So you're going to have yeah. to kind of make 
for lack of a better way, a beachhead, and then start filling. Um, so it can be done. It's 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 something that's that's certainly doable, but they have to make sure that the first bit of sand comes in very quickly so we can get that established and that the weather in the winter is cooperating, <laughs> which you know, so the week is gonna have to be picked. Um, but but you know, once that gets going, I, I want to make sure, you know, so because that is going to be basically the place that we always access this beach. There are, there's another place we could possibly do it up north. But I think that that's the, my thinking right now is this is the place is once we get established, we can go out in the trucks, turn around and come back in the road. You're not, it, it will be much more efficient. So if we're setting this up to center around that, as I said, we may move north, we may move south. Some of the logistics of what the town's doing with the seawalls may influence that. Uh, I don't want to add extra cost to them having to dig out our beach nourishment to place the, the but, but we'll work that out. Uh, and we'll try to optimize that best way we can. Thank you. All right. Uh, Rich Shea, Glades Road. Uh, thank you. Really comprehensive presentation and a great thing to move forward on. Uh, so just two questions, and I think you've answered the first one a little bit. Is phase two in any sort of active request or funding, or do you, do you just say and that's no, I will say not yet. Um, and to be honest, I mean, I think it, we weren't sure that. I mean, I was. I think we we're all surprised that that the state came through with sure. you know, doubling money, which I think is just fun. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think that, you know, again, I mean, this is. I think you know, the state has grasped onto this whole thing, and I think as these nourishments are being done or performed, I think you're going to see the hopefully the ability to get funding improve. I will say that FEMA is FEMA's a good source, potentially, um, but there are probably other sources of funding, too. I mean, it's the problem with FEMA funding is you have to wait for a declared emergency, which nobody really wants one of those. Uh, unfortunately, we have too many. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, so I guess from a, that funding standpoint, uh, no, nothing's been done yet. But I think, I think it's kind of, I think we have to sort of prove that this is workable. And then that funding is, is something that... So the second question, what is the impact to grasshopper to Bailey's crossing in terms of erosion, wave severity, does, does, does it push things? Does it, what is, what is, you, you, what's so, gonna be the impact of this project on that area? Yes, is, is it gonna help, hurt? Is it gonna be worse? Is it's certainly gonna not gonna be worse. Um, you're probably gonna get some sand. You, even though the sediment transport is to the south, some of the spreading material is gonna go to the north. So there should be some aid. I don't know how far that's going to reach north of Grasshopper, um, if, if it's if, even if we stick with that exact footprint that I'm showing. Um, but it probably will not, you know, obviously reach all the way up. I will say that the furthest north area is a little bit better protected naturally, anyways, because of the offshore rocks. Yeah. Um, but so it's not quite as critical. But you know, that's. Uh, but you know, certainly that you know, there will be some spreading material up in that direction before it starts taking you know that. that because that long short side of transport is something that's kind of a long term thing. It's a, it's a slow, gradual move down, but that spreading loss that's going to move north to south is going to happen pretty rapidly. So you're not anticipating wave severity picks up because it's being directed no, either no, not at all. on either side of the. No, the, I mean, honestly, the, this, the, you know, natural beaches are the best wave dissipator of, of anything. So anything we're putting out there is going to improve wave energy dissipation. And, and that should be improved wave. Uh, and the only, you know, my only caveat, you know, certainly there's nothing that's going to get worse, but I'm just not quite sure how much material, if, it, if, it, if it, enough material would get up in that direction that would make much of a difference. Thank you. We have questions on the chat too. Okay. Do you want to get to those or? Sure. Um, okay. okay. So somebody asked, uh, Questions. You mentioned the full project and the full scope of the replenishment being bigger. Was that funded but not granted, or just a smaller phase funding? So the the larger scale beach nourishment is what we have permits to do. It's not and what's the big ask. Um, we you know basically the most we could ask from the CCM grant in any given year is two million dollars. Um, so that ask last year was two million dollars. The ask this year was another $2 million, and basically we got both. Um, so that's the biggest ask we could make for funding uh, aspect. So that's why we're only doing partial nourishment. Um, and, but we do have the ability, we have the permits in place to make to do the full nourishment. 
Okay, and then a follow on to that question was if it was fully funded, when would the other money be available in phases? Yeah, it's just it's just not fully funded right now. So that's I guess the answer to that question. <laughs> Uh, another question from the chat. How does the finished area affect the areas near it and what does it look like initially? Um, so what is it going to look like initially as I said, and I, you know, I apologize for the, the graphics probably not being clear. Um, what it's going to look like initially is going to be, a, you know, again, this, this is a, a flat bench that's going to stick out from the seawall, but it's only going to be a couple feet lower than the top of the seawall. So there's going to be, you know, your, your, uh, you're going to have to walk down a bunch of steps to get to the beach. Um, you're going to be just walking right off onto a basically a platform. Um, and that platform is going to go out, at least right now, the way we have 100 feet. We may, as I said, we may drop that to 75 feet, but it's a, a very flat, wide platform. And then it just slopes gradually on the sides at each end, very gradually off, or into the water very gradually off. Um, and that gradual slope, so when you're walking along the shoreline, you're not going to walk into a wall of sand. You're just going to kind of see this gradual slope that you walk up to onto the, you know, onto the beach. And again, the one thing I will say, nature is going to reshape it. So na it, when nature does reshape it, it's going to end up being flatter than what we initially built. Um, and I can, you know, I can say that just because I, you know, I, I see what the natural beach slope is with the existing material, and it's a pretty, it wants to be a pretty flat beach, which is great. Um, so you know, you, what you're going to see is a lot of kind of initial loss, and again, that beach crest, but it's going to end up being a nice even a flatter gradual slope both at the ends and into the into the water. And I know I'm doing a bunch of hand motions and nobody can see that online. <laughs> <but that's okay. laughs> you guys can tell what I did. <laughs> uh, that's uh, it from the chat. Um can I grab somebody new I have a sec right because I just want to get somebody new to ask a question. Thank you, John, for being here and to the team for the tenacity because this is you know been going on for so long. It's just amazing we're getting this point. Um, I, just a follow-up question on what you just said. So if you're coming in at the gate to, to create this, um, you know, level of sand, what, how do you end, like when you come to the gate is lower than the seawall? Right. So, 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 so basically we're going to be filling part of that ramp back, you know, the, the ramp is going to be filled part way up. Okay. So you're going to, you know, basically, you know, the, you know up to, you know, you're going to basically park your car in that spot and just walk out in the sand. Because it's going to be filled up to basically that level. Okay, so it'll have to kind of go. Yeah, I mean that's, that that would probably be the last part that's built as they're you know leaving the site and just yeah. okay. you know building on that. Thank you. I was concerned about that. Uh, What's that? Your question regarding the transport. Yep. Of the sand, uh, <laughs> you, you indicated casually that there's twelve thousand different deliveries. Is that correct? Uh, th this this project will be, you know, you're wondering how many trucks. I'm just wondering about the deliveries right now. Yeah, so so this is going to be, uh, it's only about a third of the sand, so we're looking at less than 4,000 truckloads, probably more than 3,500 3, truckloads. What kind of frequency is that? And it's going to be about 80 trucks per day, 60 80 to 80 trucks, trucks per day. day. Yes. And, and, and the thing is, we, we do have a window, I didn't get into the details, but, but we're trying to not, do, uh, so I, I believe the window is after the school buses in the morning, um, and, and then we're trying to get done by 3 or 3.30 uh, you know, each day, because it is the winter, we don't want to work in the dark, um, so it's, it's going to be that kind of thing, but we're trying to, try to make it so that they can schedule those trucks after uh, you know, the school bus time. It seems to me that you don't have enough time to bring a truck into my Run it down the path, onto the beach, dump the dirt, leave, because you only have one lane with the two trucks. You'll be lining up trucks and doing the math. It'll take you 26 hours. For, for one truck? No, for your entire day. I mean, you know, the, the way these guys, I mean, you know, we've done this before. It, it can be done. It's, it, again, it's, it's, you know, sometimes they're going to come in, they may come in groups. Um, and, and again, once we have that beachhead established, you know, the trucks can, you know, they don't have to offload one at a time. It can be multiple trucks dumping all at the same time. It's not, you know, once this thing is established, um, you know, it may be a little bit hard to get the thing going at first, but once it gets going, um, you know, the trucks can offload re relatively quickly. And again, they don't, they, because there's equipment pushing material out on the beach, they don't need to, you know, specifically dump in a very precise location. The stuff can be pushed into where it needs to go. 
So that's it is it is you know it's going to be some logistics by the contractor, but this is something that's you know can be done. It's you know they they as I said they you know they they've done it now down at um, on Duxbury Beach Reservation. Uh, you know a, a good sized nourishment down there, and that's you know. It's, well, I appreciate it. it's a great project, but I'm just concerned about the after effects. What would it do to Gannett Road? As far as the, the number of truck trips? The trucks. What would be the pressure on the road? The road is under water in a significant period of time, particularly at the eastern side. So the weight of the truck continuously over a period of nine, 90 days. No. There's going to be damage to the roads. I mean, it's it, it, if there is damage to the roads, I, I, you know, typically we, we haven't seen a lot of damage to roads when we do these projects, um, but that doesn't mean that they're, I mean, you know, one thing I will say for Winthrop, uh, you know, Winthrop uh, beat up this because it was a state project, Winthrop beat up this, the state to, to give them a couple some money on because they claimed there was going to be a bunch of damage to the roads, and it turned out there really wasn't much. Um, so, I mean, it's, you know, it depends. I mean, you know, my my biggest concern is you know with, with it's not necessarily the weight of the trucks it's just if we have one of these freeze thaw winters uh, and 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 you get, end up getting the same trucks going over and creating potholes and then, then it starts to become a problem because I, you know I, I don't you know the, the roads are you know, I know they're not the, the best roads in town or, or, but just, the roads aren't bad I mean they're they're it's, you know especially um, you know compared to some of the roads that I've that that I've seen that. Uh, have had damage from when people are bringing stuff in for revetments and stuff. Um, but again, you're, you're also going to have stone coming in for revetment uh, work as well. So um, this is something that, you know, that this is part of the, in order to get these projects get done, this is this is you know, kind of the the, uh, the price you pay, I guess. It's the, I hate to say that, but, and I think that the town is aware of that, and I'm sure that they will uh, make sure that they deal with it. And just, are you talking, Five days a week or seven? Whatever. Right now we're, we're planning on five days a week. So, so if you look at the, the window we have, if we, if we end up in a three month window, we really only need uh, you know somewhere around twenty five days of trucking if it off, comes off at, at the rate that we're doing. Um, but you know, I know there's gonna be weather. I know there's. We all know what, what the winters look like. So, um, so you know, I, I think that it, you know the plan is five days a week. But if we start getting pinched up because of the at the end there, because we are required to be off. Uh, in, in uh, April, um, if we start getting pinched up, we may have to increase the, the truck uh, number of trucks a day. Is it in the scope of the project to have some uh, attenuation uh, for the neighborhoods? I uh, didn't. It's not put in there now. Well, we have, we have looked into that. Is it going to be a clerk of the works on the uh, project? Certainly, the, the, the town will be doing. You know, the town is doing the inspection, so the, the town will have somebody there every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not blocking the out here. That's going to the bus there. There's <laughs> a lot of uh, riprap, if you will, uh, from the degradation of previous um, placement of uh, material, and I've noticed that it gets. It really creates um, basically a projectile that does a job on the seawall. I've seen pretty big boulders moved around. Mm -hmm. um, I've got, got a 200 pounder that's um, actually it's bigger than that. It's well over 400 pounds on my lawn, which I like. You can pick it up and. No, I like it. <laughs> I like it. It looks nice. But uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, contingencies are. Um, in the in the project for that sort of thing. I mean, I don't have contingencies for doing uh, rock cleanup. I mean, generally, what we typically do, and I'd say that we did at Winthrop, is we bury what's there, um, and because if you're in the beach nourishment footprint, it's buried, so it's not going to be a projectile. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I and it's you know, and I don't see any problems with that. I mean, if uh, we may have some sort of contingency if there's uh, lots of like lobster traps or that kind of thing to, for them, people to clean that kind of stuff up. But I generally will not do rocks. If that makes sense. Just one more thing. It was a few years ago, I think, my memory isn't that sharp on this. There was a presentation by a company that was um, talking about four, four shore. Um, four shore protection. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Foreshore protection. Will that this project integrate with that at some point? 
I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. This may be them. This is them. Okay. Oh, that, oh. that was your. All right. So we, we were talking about. Yeah. Okay. We, <laughs> I don't remember the terminology yeah, I used. Well, this, this actually went into some fairly innovative things uh, using um, wave disruption. We, uh, we've, that's, that's Fred, Fred is, is uh, involved with a lot of the wave disruption stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what we had indicated, and uh, you know, Fred's going to hammer me for this, which is okay. Because, no, you know, um, it, when we have a high tide range, it's very difficult to put in, uh, you know, breakwater type structures because mm -hmm. unless you want, you know, unless they're sticking way up, they, you know, and, and we, we have a 10 foot tide range, we end up with a 12 foot tide range of spring tide. And then we end up with three feet of surge on top of that. So unless the thing's sticking up well into that level, you're really not interfering with the waves at all. Um, and so if you put something offshore, that's you know, um, you know, so we, I've dealt with these. I've designed some systems like down in the Gulf of Mexico where I've got a tide range like this. Uh, it's it, you can actually attenuate waves with with um, those types of devices. But in an environment like this, the structure has to be so massive that it ends up being cost prohibitive. And that example of Winthrop is great. That is one time when somebody built something like that. I'm not saying it was a great idea because it, you know, it, it helped one area, but it really has to hurt the people next to them. <laughs> but, but you know, that is, it's that at that scale. I mean, that those structures, the northern structure there, which has been got fixed in the 1950s, that structure's footprint. Um, I believe it's in it's in 20 feet of water, so that footprint is somewhere around 250 feet from front to back of that structure, um, because it, it comes up at a slope and it, it but it's it's massive, um, and that is as I said, tens of millions of dollars for each one of the, one of those. It's the, at that level. I'm not even sure, you know, from an environmental standpoint, you you could even get the equipment out there to move those stones without doing so much environmental damage. At the time of the 1930s, they probably didn't care, but you know now it's you know that's uh, you know just a massive undertaking. I hope that answers. <laughs> I think there might have been a question in the back of the paint. Yeah, thirty thirty I'm sorry, it came in late. When when do you plan to start? We're planning on starting either sometime in January or the first of February. And you have to be off by April one. Uh, mid April, I believe, okay. but yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you're sort of catching, talking about um, the town committing to maintaining um, and just the commitment is good enough for FEMA, but you also mentioned monitoring. Is there any monitoring plan? I believe there's annual monitoring plan right now, um, and so that's that's typically what what's, would be required. So you go out and do monitoring as long as you're doing your surveying elevation. profiles, elevation okay. profiles. Um, and just seeing what percentage fill in the, and we usually your monitor goes beyond the footprint, so you're seeing one of the same migration too as well. And if, is there some tipping point where the beach nourishment has now dissipated so much that it, it no longer would qualify for FEMA support? Um, I mean, if, yes, uh, like but I, I won't say that we've defined that tipping point, and sometimes I won't even say FEMA's defining that tipping yeah. point, so it's not, I, I can't really give you a uh, definitive answer on that. I'm just worried about the, the time um you, you also mentioned that if you double the size and the volume of the material you're putting in you quadruple the length the the life right. lifespan of it and, and um, so there is i mean there is that issue what what, yeah. what level we're, we're able to do here but again um and, and the thing is again the fema stuff only comes around if you have a declared emergency right. so this could just dis, you know, dissipate and if the town's not made commitment to maintain it and a certain percentage of it goes away and you haven't had a named storm you know you, you probably look you know, I, I would hate for the town to always de depend on FEMA to come through with with the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there because I will say the state of Florida rides on this. I mean, they've got, you know, they, the state, we, we as taxpayers pay for a lot of the church in Florida through FEMA. Um, a lot of their projects are, are monitored, maintained, engineered projects. And I would say that three quarters of you know, the developed coast of Florida has been nourished. So these, but any any time they get hit, you know, the the funding for their beach nourishment comes back through FEMA or three quarters of it does. So that's that's you know, and so I my suggestion is at least keep that in mind so that you know the, the Massachusetts is not 
left in the dust. So maybe Florida taxpayers can pay for some Massachusetts <laughs> beach version in the future. Um, so that's, you know, it's just something to, to keep in mind. And, and, and it's just something that I don't think the state has taken, you know, the, the communities of the state have taken advantage of. Because um, the, the one project I mentioned is actually a private project. It's a, it's a homeowners group that has maintained their beach nourishment and they were able to get food left. Um, so, but I, I've yet to see a town um, in Massachusetts actually use that aspect. I think the state may have used it once. But. I'm just wondering if the results of the monitoring over time might fuel, hey, this is a great, this, look how great this small part of the project was. We should invest in the next phase. And that's the hope. Yeah, yeah. And that's the hope that the monitoring, the monitoring isn't, you know, the monitoring goes into maybe using for FEMA, but the monitoring has other benefits, right? Yeah. So, and you know, the state, again, has been doing a great job of, of me, you know, suggesting and pushing people to monitor and it, it helps them, it helps everybody come up with design standards, you know, going down the road here because, you know, uh, you know, I know that the big push now is towards more, uh, green infrastructure as opposed to hard infrastructure, you know, the, the concrete uh, or stone. So with that in mind, you know, as some certain projects are done, you really just need to see how they perform. Because there's a lot of, you know, like the Winter Beach is, is a good example, something that's overperformed for what it has been done, but I can also point to some nourishment projects that haven't done so well. So it's, uh, um, you know, I think that the more data we get and the more monitoring we do, it has benefits outside of just the FEMA. Are we getting a third of the sand or a half of the sand? About, I'm, I'm going to conservatively say a third. I'm hoping for more. Okay. What does the town maintaining look like? Does it look like the town is sending trucks in to put their own sand down? Or is it, I mean, it, the town maintaining is the part where I triumph of hope over experience in certain <laughs> cases. So I just want right. to know how you envision that. So, I mean, I, I you know, I think it, it sort of depends on what the town has funds to do. So we're going to be, you know, it's monitored. We'll monitor what percentage is done. Now the town, right now, because we're not doing the complete project, my suggestion is that the town look into um, getting other funding to not really look as maintenance, but it's an expansion of the project over time and see how it's performing um, and seeing what areas are performing well. And if there's an area that's underperforming, you know, rethink what we're doing there. And, you know, it might be, as we're looking at the way things are going, is it that suggestion to, to move the effort up closer to, uh, you know, filling the north section north of Grasshopper, or is it better off, you know, moving the the? And it would be section. under this permitting that's already existing. And that permit already exists for that entire stretch. That is, there was a, a taking. I can't remember what year it was done, but the, yeah. all that property has been taken and is now right. under the town's control. So, um, it is. Um, sorry, but anyone else has questions? Um, the the town maintenance of it would it be the town doing it with their own equipment or would the town be putting out to bid for somebody to come in and do uh, i would say because of the volume you're talking about it would be somebody coming in and doing it the town doesn't have okay. that level of equipment um because again you see the size of a project that's being yeah. done and so a maintenance project if you're doing you know trying to maintain something it's going to be on the order of five thousand or ten thousand yards it's not going to be a couple hundred yards if that makes sense Okay, and the cost of that on a town budget would be two million, four million. Uh, it, I, it depends on performance. I, I, sure. I, and again, it's, I, I, the way I look at this right now, because I haven't really thought about the, you know, that just that simple maintenance. I'm looking to try to encourage going and trying to get the rest of the template built over the next oh, yeah. four or five years. So that's that's really where I'm aiming, not necessarily to. Just trying to maintain this piece because this piece is, is relatively small and and I'm you know I'm a little nervous about the performance because it's this is you know it's a short fat stretch of beach which I hate to do I'd rather do a long fat stretch of beach but <laughs> it is what it is I mean you know it, okay. it, but but I, at the same time I think that this is you know as and I want to really uh, get you guys thinking about this you know when you put sediment in the system it's never lost it's going somewhere and as long as it's not going way offshore. As long as it's you know, providing, you know, staying in either the bar or moving to, to areas to the sides, it is having a net benefit, not only to dissipating wave energy, but also to maintaining the existing structures you guys have along the shoreline. There's a question in the chat. Um, Please don't. 
Yeah, people are still, there's still 15 people on the on the chat. Uh, are other situate beaches viable candidates for nourishment pending funding? And how are beaches qualified? Um, so yes, uh, we actually designed a project for Hummer Rock. Um, but because it's the private issue, it's the privacy issue, it kind of hit the skids. Um, so um, we did look at it for Peggy Beach. Uh, but I, you know, be honest with you, it just did not, from a cost benefit standpoint, does not look like that that would be a worthwhile candidate. It's hard because it's a short stretch of beach and how, um, you know, the limited number of houses to protecting, it just, it, the cost benefit just doesn't really work. But those are probably the two best candidates would be Homer Rock and Peggy, you know, your situation. One further question, sorry to monopolize this. Why didn't you, or what was the consideration to go with trucks versus a barge from offshore? Was it permitting? Yes. Uh, uh, well, so the Winter Beach project was originally proposed to go offshore in Sandline. Uh, and I worked on it for 10 years before we got denied down in Washington. Uh, so I, I, it was uh, a good portion of my coastal engineering career at that point. Uh, and I really don't want to redo that. Um, so right now, I, I think that it's just, it's a political thing. I think at some point that's going to open up a bit, but it's, you know, the, the fisheries folks are very adamant that they don't want to see um, dredging offshore. And, and uh, you know, the, we'll see if there's any movement on that. I mean, as again, I think part of the problem in Massachusetts, if we had more public shoreline, I think there'd be a bigger push. Um, but because so much of the shoreline is private, um, it makes it hard for people to get organized and do a, a large project. Because when, if you're doing a beach, you know, if you're doing a sand source from offshore, it's a big project. It's, you know, it's, it's $3 million just to get the dredge up here to start. So it's, you know, these projects are huge when you typically do it. In the 1960s, the town would put equipment out there and just pull the sand back up. You and had that to tell is, me that, didn't you? What's that? <laughs> you had to tell me that. Well, you? I mean, in terms of what they think is are <laughs> disrupting fisheries, it's that sand is going out there, that sand is coming back, that sand is going out there. So they weren't, I don't know if that just went it's away. It's probably one of the worst things you can do, um, because if you think about it, so the natural system wants to drag the sand off, form that yeah. bar, and it, it, that bar is a great wave break. Right. But people thought it was a great idea, and I'm, you're, you guys are not the only community. Go out, look at that great bar out there. Let's grab that, pull it back on. Well, what you've just done is you've allowed more wave energy to attack your beach. Okay. Um, and and then, that, then that material just gets, because it's generally finer material that's in that bar, just kind of gets dispersed and goes maybe lost off completely offshore. Um, so that the idea of, of uh, raking the beach in that way, mm -hmm. uh, which is, was a very common thing, caused more problems than it helped. Uh, Nantasket Beach, I believe, is probably one of the best examples. They did probably one of the, you know, it, it's a, a very public beach. People loved it, but it, it has similar sediment. It has a lot of cobble in it, actually, naturally. And what DCR used to do is they used to rake the beach and get rid of the cobbles. So they took the cobbles away, and over the years, they got rid of tens of that thousands of cubic yards of cobbles, which lowered the beach, but it also disrupted the system. So now they, you know, now they have no beach, and they've got water coming over the wall all the time. But I mean, they, they really kind of created their own problem. So yeah, you really just let nature do its thing. Um, and, and the best thing you can do in these cases where you've held the shoreline is bring in more sediment to kind of reestablish the shoreline that isn't natural anymore because you don't have that sediment supply. Do you know if access to the beach will be able to go through the gates as they are now at that corner, or will those gates have to be adjusted? I mean, you should be able to use them. I, think okay. the elevation. I mean, as I said, that, that, that ramp is going to, the sand is going to yeah. fill up into that ramp. I mean, there might be some wind blowing sand. But the trucks, system. will the trucks be able to go through that gate? We're going to widen it. And that will be able okay. to be reestablished. I, I, <laughs> All right. That's part of the, sorry. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I have to be fair. <laughs> John, you're going to have to tell us exactly what's going to happen to those pillars. You know, we love them. So, is it just the the there's the pillars and then there's the right? Oh, are the openings the part yeah. that the pillars will stay? I believe we can keep the pillars. I don't. I don't see. I, I'm, yeah, they're on there. I'm trying to envision that. I don't think. Have no, uh, the it's the size section. of the opening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, we, we looked at widening the opening. I, I don't remember. I, I'm sorry, I can't visualize the pillars right now, but I. 
Uh, we're going to leave the, the painted sign there. <laughs> I love taking photographs of that picture. It makes it look like a sunny day no matter when I'm there. <laughs> Old mural. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, during construction, will the beach be open to access for walking and it will be. Um, the, the thing is, what I would suggest is not using that the main access for the truck. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but the, the other access is further north. I mean, yeah, of course. And then you can walk the whole beach. Or... Yeah, just yeah, just stay out of the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll see the trucks coming. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I in other projects we have not. Uh, I think I uh, I kept construction equipment away from where plumbers nest, but I've never tried to keep construction equipment away from people. I assume people. Well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Yes. Oh, Fred. Yes. Um, is the uh, second half, the second half of the project uh, required to use sand as a numbers? Uh, uh, for the permits, yeah. In order permits. to meet that, what's required the permits, we would have to use the same, have to use the same time of material we're bringing in. Okay, um, uh, and I'll just for your information that there's, there's been a deployment um, in, in SACO or SACO, however it's pronounced. Name. Name. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, three, uh, three row uh, because of, of the conditions. Yep. At 13 feet high. You okay. know what I'm talking about. Um, they're just waiting for finance. Is this is private project or public? Okay. okay. Data rate. They're trying to get the uh, Army Corps to pay for it. And they don't want to. That's all I have. <laughs> that, was, that didn't hurt, did it? No, not at all. Not me. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Great. 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 Okay. 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 Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll end the meeting and end the recording. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Right. Oh, you, uh, I should mention there's a website listed at the bottom for uh, where you'll you find information on the project. I'm sure that the 